I'm very excited about this, and we do have a, a have a great panel. I just want to say that when when Steve called and asked me to moderate uh, this panel, I had a flashback to uh, a day in 1990 when I was working at the Wall Street Journal, and the late uh, Senator Paul Sagas came to visit us, and he said, "I have some very big news for you." He got a small group of us together. He said, "I have some very big news for you." He said, "I'm going to run for president." And he said, the reason I am telling the Wall Street Journal first is because the policy that I'm going to make at the core of my campaign is eliminating corporate or quarterly reporting by corporations. And we all know how that worked out for uh, the late Senator Sangas. But so, as Steve said, this has been around for a very long time, but I do think it's gotten increasingly intense. Uh, in the last couple of years, in part because of the low return environment and the desperate search for yields, uh, uh, in part because of the role played by activist investors. Uh, and, and I think it's, it, it's more critical than ever uh, because of the huge changes uh, going on in business right now. There is something like a new industrial revolution being driven by technology that requires large investments and whether the structure will allow for those investments uh, in the U.S. I think is a, a very interesting question. So I'm delighted to be here with the four of you. Uh, let me introduce you quickly and then we'll uh, dive right in. Ron O'Hanley is the president and CEO of State Street Global Advisors. Lydia Beebe is at Wilson Sonsini, but formerly the corporate secretary at Chevron. Correct. And Andy Palmer is the chief investment officer for the Maryland uh, pension funds. And uh, Neary Buckspan is at EY and has worked on these issues for many, many years. A a and so I want to start with the, the basic question. In fact, I saw I was just as I was sitting in the back of the room, I saw uh, a, 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 a clip from Business Insider where Henry Blodgett had uh, interviewed Hillary Clinton and said, how do, we, how, do, how do we do something about quarterly capitalism? And Hillary Clinton's initial response was, I think this is one of the greatest problems facing American capitalism. Is that true? Is this one of the great problems facing American capitalism? Ron. Well, uh, I'm not sure it's the greatest problem facing American capitalism, but there is such pressure now on the short term and when you think about it, most liabilities are long-term. I'll defer to my colleague from the state of Maryland here, but if you're managing money for a pension, you're thinking in 30, 40, 50 years, you're not thinking in 30, 40, 50 days, uh, or whatever a quarter might be. Um, so, so that would be one. Second, to the point that you just made, um, big change and substantial change takes time. And to the extent to which all the incentives are in place that uh, really focus managers, focus shareholders, focus investment managers, which I hope we'll get to on the short term, you're going to have very little incentive for, be it an investor, be it for a manager, to be thinking about the long term. And therefore, lots of things that require a long term focus simply won't happen. So you see it as a serious problem. I do. Now, Lydia, you look at a com company like Chevron, a lot of the investments made by Chevron have very long-term payouts. So they're clearly making the investments, right? Did you feel pressure to not make smart long-term investments for the sake of the short term? Well, I do say I, I had the good fortune to work at a company that did have a long horizon and, and was definitely managing for the long term because you have to as you say, invest, I mean, it takes 10 years for a lot of these investments to, you know, pay out their first dollar. But at the same time, I do think that you see that, that quarterly pressure that Ron referred to because every quarter, it's very clear in everybody's mind what the analysts are expecting your returns to be and whether you're going to be above or below. And there's certainly a lot of discussion when you're going to miss expectations on how, what the story is going to be to the street and how you're going to kind of explain that. And, um, you know, we have a lot of compensation system. A lot of it is, is driven by your annual returns and, and the metrics that you set up on, in many cases, are annual rather than five or 10 years. And in Chevron, when a managers move from one job to another, it, it was kind of a joke sometimes that people would le leave one job just before they had the, the, the tragedy of their decision they made. And they'd always be one step ahead of, of kind of the dominoes falling in their wake. Um, but anyway, it, it is, um, it is true that I think there's a lot of pressure to, to get results immediately. W worse than it's been in the past? 
Um, you know, it's a little hard to say that, uh, but I think it's, it's more prevalent. I mean, you know, when I first started in this business, you, you looked at the stock price daily, if that. And now that it's on everybody's phone, you look at the stock price minute by minute or hourly. And so I think the um, information at everybody's fingertips makes it so much more important. And the fact that investors know everything immediately and, and the headlines react to it, I think it, it's much more present on people's minds. Andy, in the interview I was referring to earlier, uh, Hillary Clinton referred to a study, and I don't know the provenance of this study, but she said a bunch of uh, business people were asked, uh, um, if you could make an investment that you knew would pay off in 10 years, but you also knew would, would hurt your earnings and your share price in the next year, would you do it? And she claims they all said no. Uh, I mean, is, 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 now I don't know how you know that it's going to pay off in 10 years, which is a bigger problem, but is that the kind of environment you think we're dealing with? I, I think that's true. I mean, there's, a, there's an example that, um, um, I, that's recent is Walmart. So um, Walmart uh, found itself in a competitive uh, pressures from Amazon um, and decided that they needed to do two things, which was to invest in um, uh, higher, better technology and to try to improve the customer experience by um, uh, upgrading the, the, uh, the quality of their employees, and they decided they were going to pay people more. So um, they initiated this maybe this time last year. Um, by, uh, around October, uh, they came out and said, well, um, you know, our earnings are uh, down, and gonna be, it's going to take a little bit longer for this all to play out. And um, uh, the stock dropped like 10 percent that day, and it was a, you know, the, a really um, tough day for them. And there was a quote I read that says, um, uh, one of the investors said, they're making all these investments, but what happens if revenue doesn't come in at the three or four percent they're projecting? Um, uh, how do you know that investments are going to lead to better revenues? So there's a, there's a, there's a disconnect that we all, it's kind of human nature. Uh, uh, even my whole career as an investor, I've been trying to uh, turn myself into a sociopath so that I, 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 can, <laughs> I, I can not do what normal human beings would do. Uh, because you, normally you have to, you know, you you look. I mean, we're going to all have. Uh, we, we all know that uh, fatty foods are bad for us, and uh, long term we shouldn't eat it. But you know, 80% of us are going to eat the dessert that they give us at lunch, right? So there's a there's a disconnect between the short term and the long term. I shouldn't have said that because now everybody's going to be judging their their. Uh, <laughs> please ha enjoy your dessert. Don't 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 feel guilty. Um, but there's, there, is a, there is a disconnect between short term and long term, and, and so it's, it really is an issue. Walmart's probably doing the right thing, um, but the shareholders are focusing on the string of quarterly returns, and they're saying, okay, if, if we thought this company had a value based on a, a uh, projection of long term returns, we look, we're pre taking the present value all the way back to today, and now that is, that, this change has made that less predictable, um, even if it's, may be better, but it's less predictable, it's going to impact the value of the company in the short but the, term. But, but isn't the other problem that the long term is unpredictable and the last quarter is pretty clear? I mean, you have oh, to yeah. have had conversations with, with, uh, with businesses that have, you know, uh, fallen short quarter after quarter and they tell you, but stick with us because we're in it for the long term. Yeah, we do, we do have that. And as, a, as an organization, we try to build that into how, you know, we invest. But, um, but it is an issue, it is an issue uh, but I think it's, it's, a, it's an issue not just with corporate corporations, it's an issue with my organization. You know, we, we're run by a state uh, uh, legislative process, basically, and that process is basically looking at, uh, you know, last year's expenditures and forecasting. There's really no long-term um, vision unless somebody really drives it. So it's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an endemic problem, I think, culturally, um, and that the re what we're trying to do with boards and those types of things is, is to create uh, a, an avenue to make better decisions for the long term through those types of things. You wanted to jump in on that, Ron? Yeah, w one of the challenges uh, in, in this, w what you're talking about, either your example from Hillary Clinton or even the, the Walmart example is from the investment, per the, the actual people that are doing the investing, right? They typically have a heck of a lot of visibility around the short term, I mean, because Let's face it, unless something dramatic happens, this quarter is going to look a whole lot like last quarter. They've got full transparency on the last quarter. If you're talking about a 10-year investment or even the kind of change that Walmart was talking about, and if you 
and I'm not picking on Walmart here, because uh, I, I actually don't know the particulars of the situation, but if Walmart, Walmart doesn't have a policy of a lot of transparency and engagement and repeated communication with the investment community, to all of a sudden drop this on them, and I'm not defending the investment community, but it's very easy to say, yeah, okay, um, let's see if that actually happens. I'm gonna focus on the short term, and what I see now is a lot of money being put out and not a lot of return. So um, to make this kind of, uh, to get this kind of focus on the long term, it's not just about saying we're going to do it, it's really about kind of broad-based communication of a strategy that's well thought out, consistent, uh, one can see the actual milestones occurring over time and that there's some kind of feedback loop to the investment community. So, so we're going to get to fixes in a minute, but let's just stick for a minute with causes, if we can, Neary. Why do you, if this is a problem, why is it happening? So, you know, you pointed to some of the causes, and I think one of the main causes, there's uh, greater volatility in the market, Lydia's point about uh, information that's much more available than it's ever been. There's some nervousness because you get the value of your portfolio immediately. There's a great focus, in my view, on the results rather than what's not what's driving the results. And that's where there's a key issue for me, right? Is whether you're overweight, not what the root cause of you being overweight and what your trajectory and whether you are heavier than you used to be and what is your strategy taking it going forward. And people are focusing at times on the wrong metrics. And this is, I think it's a team play. It's a, it's a colossal, colossal issue for everyone. It's a failure of Ron to communicate. It's a failure for investors to spend the time and understand. Uh, it's the way managers are being incentivized. And, and to me, there's kind of simple three building blocks to it. Uh, the, the, the first building block is simply, what is your strategy, being it what it may, right? And what is your time horizon? <coughs> And when you start thinking about it, the last panel we just had was uh, vivid evidence of how things could change and quite quickly. So uh, wh whether you're long term, you could be long term, you could be ready to change, you should be. Uh, the second building block that I think is, is key is once you define your strategy, you it should be associated with your stakeholders. Where are your stakeholders? Different stakeholders may have different preferences, different time horizons. Once you define that, there's a way to how you manage it, how you govern it, how you control it. And the, the third pillar would be, uh, how you communicate, how you create the feedback loop, how you make sure that you're going, and, and I want to focus on the third one, because I want to make sure that we don't throw the baby with the bathwater. There's a great uh, context about transparency and making sure that people need to be transparent in sharing with the market. So if we're telling folks, hey, don't share anything with the market quarterly because it's endangered, the system, right, I think we're running a risk of throwing the baby with the bathwater and transparency. The issue is what should be shared, how it should be shared, and how analysts should Perhaps analysts and investors should navigate. So, the so you would not, you would not get rid of quarterly reporting. I mean, if uh, anything, we should not, your transparency would suggest companies should be reporting more frequently. Uh, in fact, companies are reporting frequently. Uh, companies are reporting daily, right? In, in theory, right? My, my theory is quite simple, right? If, if you have a transportation system that's designed for the future, right? Uh, we, we we can mitigate speeding by doing something quite simple: close the roads. Nobody will speed. I can tell you that, right? But what you do is you undermine your transportation system, right? To me, if you want to create a transportation system of the future, a communication system of the future, there is no way to avoid it. It's got to be managed. It's got to be right-sized. It's abuse got to be mitigated, but I do not feel we need to close the roads. Yeah. A a Andy, what about compensation? I mean, some people have pointed to compensation schemes as driving short-term results, doing, you know, using, using money to do buybacks that, that help you make your targets to, to hit your uh, uh, bonus. Yes, I, I've been looking at our proxy voting um, guidelines. We have uh, in our investment policy manual, which kind of governs um, how we invest, um, it's, we have 35 pages of proxy voting guidelines. Um, and, and the, if I go by page numbers and the and line numbers, uh, the, the biggest part of it is on compensation uh, for executives. And I think maybe that's one of the places we do talk about in our proxy voting, um, we, we, if we're going to support proxies that are focused on financial metrics and those types of things. But there are also um, metrics that are linked to uh, stock price performance. Uh, relative to the market and relative to peers. And I'm not sure if that's, uh, I have to think about that, whether or not that's the right um, uh, message to be sending CEOs. Um, and so I do think there, are, there is a compensation issue there. Um, there th they need to be thinking about the long term and, and longer term 
performance, not just these short-term things. And, and it does happen. They say, okay, I'm this close. I'm this close to getting a nice bonus. <laughs> What, what do I do for the next quarter to, to maybe help uh, move that along? And, there's, there's, there's some, definitely and, some and is results. there anything more certain than a buyback that will get me that result? Exactly, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I, Lydia, go ahead. Well, yeah, I, sure. just, I just wanted to jump in before we leave the causes. I mean, it, maybe I, we should have started here. I mean, the whole investor base has changed, and how people invest has changed so much in the in the last, uh, you know, 100 years or whatever. I mean, I think if you go back like 75 years, the average stock was held for seven years and was probably held by an individual who was investing in, in at least a large part for dividends. And now the average stock, at least one recent study I read, said, you know, the average holding is 17 weeks and people are investing for returns, a broader returns than just dividends. And so, and of course, there's m much of the investment is in large funds, and so um, stocks turn over a lot faster than they did at one time. And so I think that's part of what drives the short-termism is the the focus on returns. And, and yet, if you again, if you look at your your former company Chevron, is the is the investor base really that unstable, or do you have a core of investors who are there for the uh, the long term? Well, I, you definitely have a core of investors that are there for the long term. One of them is sitting right next to me. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, all the, the big money managers are in the stock, um, but they do change the amount of their holdings, um, and it, it goes up and down. And so there is movement in the stock all the time. And so I think, um, I, I think people watch the small movements a lot more than, than they might have many years ago. Yeah, Andy, you want to, to chime in there? There is this a, a giant agency problem. So it, uh, back uh, 75 years ago, if you owned the shares, you owned the shares. Now you own a mutual fund, um, or you're like, for, if you're us, we have um, I don't know thousands of stocks, thousands of them, um, and we own them through intermediaries. Uh, so we are so far away from the the, the CEO and the, and the uh, C-suite that were making decisions that. Um, uh, you know, we, we are, we, we almost, it, it's almost impossible for us to be effective as uh, fiduciaries in, in, in impacting those people. This is an important point uh, that Andy's raising because each one of those agents or intermediaries themselves have their short-term pressures. So there's a lot of focus on buybacks and um, buybacks can indeed cause some short-term pressure. But if you think about all of the metrics that are in the system, they're inherently short-term. I mean, start with the average CEO or senior manager pay, and there's a lot of chest thumping that, well, there's a base salary and an annual bonus and a long term. Uh, well, how's the long term calculated? Well, it's an annual grant, right? And that annual grant is very much driven by what happened that year. So you can call it long term, but it's very short term. Now think about the agents that are doing the investing, right? They're well, they're actually not people like us. We'll come to our role uh, later. But y your average portfolio manager, right, is being measured on one, three, and five years, typically. Uh, but how are they being bought, right? It, it, how are investors choosing them? Well, how did you do recently? How's that Morningstar rating? Which is all inherently short-term. So you've got this piling up of, of short-term metrics on top of short-term metrics that really crowds out the long-term investment. So, so, the, so the incentive to do buybacks is exaggerated. I, I think there's an incentive to do buybacks. I would say that the impact of it, and it, is it the root cause of this problem, that is exaggerated. Uh, Alan, yes. I, I can make an observation. I think the, you asked about compensation and buybacks, and, and I think there, there, there's a presumption that there's an efficient market theory, that the stock price will represent at any given time the, the future, but it doesn't, because the study that you refer to, referred to that I believe Hillary Clinton mentioned is a 2006 study that studies about 400, uh, over 400 executives, and they've indicated, surprisingly so, that, uh, and I, I believe the number is 75%, they will uh, forego positive NPV projects if it provides enhancement to the current uh, earnings. They will smooth earnings, right, if they believe the market will reward them for that. And they say they're doing it because of investor pressure. So they don't do it because, and arguably some will do it because of their compensation. In, in, in theory, it just means that the investors don't believe 
that the positive return is there. To, to Correct. Right. And but the, if you if you buy the to say within couple standard deviation you can do that, then arguably what you do today you have not followed the theory of you know efficient cap, efficient market. So what I'm doing is I'm following uh, some fiction, if you will. So by by distributing uh, cash by doing. Uh, Share buyback, you know, share buyback in no economic theory will increase any economic value of an enterprise. It could argue that, you know, potentially shareholders may be better positioned to deploy capital because you see it on excess cash. There's uh, some things there, but all other things held equal, it doesn't increase uh, NPV of an enterprise. Now, when you do that, if the market does reward manager for doing it, there's some asymmetry that not one needs to understand why this asymmetry exists and study that. Right? And, and maybe it's the fault of investors to buying into this illusion in the first place, uh, rather than the fault of managers to do that. Yeah. Now, if I, if I can take it to the next extension, just simply thinking about uh, tying it to my earlier comment, I think, Ron, tying it to the current performance is interesting, but not tying it to the goals and the drivers. Associate with is another one, because if I'm heading R&D, if I'm heading uh, other things and I'm will forgo it in order to increase EPS, right? This is not the right decision that the shareholders should be rewarding me for. However, if they don't have any visibility into it, if it's not being discussed, right, there's some distortion in the system that the system cannot correct. So if I have to advocate yet again what need to be in quarterly earnings or quarterly disclosures or any other disclosures, is peeling the onion a little bit, not only the results, what drives it? What is your strategy? How you think about it and where you are today vis-a-vis -vis your plan? But let me, just yeah, go one, ahead. one other quick thing. The, Alan, on top of all this, uh, staying on causes is CEO tenure, right? CEO tenure now is down to about an average of five years in the S&P. Five years is not a long time to actually get a long-term agenda conceived, let alone executed. So, and we should, get, we should get to the role of the board in that in just a second. But I just want to, before we, we leave this topic of buybacks, do the four of you agree that companies are spending more money on buybacks than they should? I guess, to, I, I, guess I, I don't think buybacks are necessarily bad. But, um, but, but the but, level of buybacks we have had for the last couple of years is extraordinarily high. Do uh, these companies have better use for that that's, money? That's the question, right? So but, the question and is, do you, think, it, do you it, as an investor think they do? I, do you think too much, the incentives are causing companies to spend too much on buybacks? Um, I can't make a blanket statement like that because I, I don't, but, but basically we have, so we have different kinds of investors that work for us and, and, and uh, one group of investors that we, we engage with um, look for companies that have long-term growth prospects and, and some, one, at least one of them uses a return on capital measure as, you know, who's efficient at using capital? So um, to say that they have cash and have the ability to spend money on capital projects here or there um, and they decide as an organization that they really don't have good places to put that money to earn attractive returns and they decide to return it to shareholders, that's, that is an efficient use of capital. Right. But, so there, there is some of that that goes on. I, I think right now you can look in corporate balance sheets and see in the last few years that um, they, after the 2000 financial crisis uh, in 2002, companies delevered. Um, and, they, and so they, they had much better balance sheets now they are using their using debt to buy back stock and they're making their balance sheets more risky so i think right now as a group probably going too far in, in that direction Prob so probably spending too much yeah. ron yeah yeah i think i think that all things being equal there probably is too much uh being spent on buybacks it's almost a no regrets decision right uh shareholders love it they love it for all the things that we've been talking about so uh, in given the lack of visibility and the lack of reward to management on investing for the long term. It's a logical thing to be done. L you agree with that, Lydia? Um, I think that I agree, um, generally speaking, that in, in my view is that it, you could make a better return if you actually invested that money in something long term, that that would, that would have a, a better impact to shareholders. And so from a simplistic point of view, almost any money on share buybacks is, is well, not I the most um, productive long term. Well, I guess from the, from the, uh, from the uh, public interest point of view, the question is, does the company have a better investment to make than the shareholder has to make with the money that they're, they're getting back? And, and so that gets to, like we, we, at the previous group talked about the global environment. So if we are in a slow global growth environment, um, maybe they don't have, if, if their cost of capital is 
15%, say, I don't know what the uh, uh, cost of equity capital is, and they can't find projects that are going to return more than 15% with that equity capital, maybe they should give it back. So th it, there, is, there is a bit of, um, there's not a lot of places to go to generate growth, and the growth is coming, and in, in, um, in expansion is in places that are not capital intensive. So it's in you know, software businesses and things like that. That's where growth is happening in the economy. We're not having growth in um, you know, manufacturing plants. It's, it's kind of fundamental to the discussion we're having, I think, because if, 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 if you don't think that they're spending too much on buybacks, then we don't really have a short-term problem. If there is a short-term problem, Well, buybacks are not the only, only symptom of short-term. But it's certainly the most visible, uh, costly one that you can see out there right now. R Neary. Uh, again, there's no, no, I wish there was one. No, one I'm trying to get a yes and no, yes or no answer, but I'm going to. I, 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 I apologize. I mean, I, <laughs> you oppose yes I, or no. I know no I'm the last on the panel. I don't know if I can deliver this way, yes or no, <laughs> yes or no answer. But I think the, the, the issue is kind of twofold. One is, first, if you go to corporate finance theory, right, there should be some return to shareholders, right? It should be what, 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 whether dividends or uh, buyback, and then we can argue about what's the more sufficient way to do it. The other question would be, uh, think about the stakeholders, who they are. You got creditors and you got shareholders. You may satisfy one, you can potentially erode or undermine the others. Now, sometimes it's not that visible uh, because the you know, cash is ample now, we know. Uh, interest rates are at historical low, but let's turn the clock a little bit and think about the different cycle. Uh, and then uh, run those companies through the wind tunnel and see whether, and this is the role of boards, this is the role of management, and this is the role of oversight, and say, will I survive when I need to roll over my debt? Will I survive when I need to get, think about my CapEx for the next five years, right? And when you do it, you simply have an assessment of where you want to be. Once you go through this exercise, and this is an exercise the company should undertake, and their investors should do similar exercises, this is why they're analyzing it, and then conclude of where, whether the company is where it needs to be. You have a flip side of the argument. There are many arguments about U.S. companies that are sitting with way too much cash on the balance sheet, and they got to do something with it. Either invest or distribute. So you got two sides yeah, of let, the coin me, sometimes. Uh, or we'll, we'll, you wanted to say something? No. Let, we, uh, let me get a sense of the audience first, and then we'll come back and talk about <laughs> solutions once we've determined whether people here think there is a problem. Uh, a show of hands if you think there is a short-term problem in corporate America. Okay, and then anyone who thinks there isn't, hand high. Good, we got four of you here and we're, we wanna hear from you in a minute. Uh, and, and then the follow-on follow -on question, show of hands if you think in the last couple of years companies have spent too much money on, uh, share, on stock buybacks. Many fewer on that, so I, I, we should explore that a little bit. But then, show of hands if uh, uh, show of hands if you if you don't think that companies have spent. That some of you may just be unsure, but if you don't think companies have spent too much on share buybacks, raise your hand. So we got two, three of you. Okay, so I wouldn't call that absolute agreement that there is a problem, um, but. The four of you think that the incentives are probably out of balance. So what do we do about it, Ron? Uh, this isn't going to lend itself to a one-sentence answer because I think it's, it requires a real comprehensive look. I do believe it starts with the board. And I'm not so sure we're going to be able to turn uh, board uh, CEO 10 years from five years into 20. Um, so therefore, the continuity, I think, needs to be at the board. What's happened to boards now is, on the one hand, I think that they've systematically gotten better over the last uh, 10 or 20 years, uh, far more professional, far more diverse. Uh, there's more to be done there. But at the same time, as good as they've gotten, the burdens on them have gotten even greater. And what gets sacrificed really is the focus on long-term strategy. For any of us who have sat on boards, there's many in here that do, you know that's always what gets sacrificed in the board meeting. You, know, you got to hear the audit report, you got to hear the risk report, and we'll defer the discussion on strategy till later. So then you couple that into how does quarterly reporting really work? I mean, really good quarterly reporting ought to be, here's how we did in the last quarter. You can read it. It's you know, going to be out there right away. We'll spend 10 minutes on that. Let's spend the next hour and a half talking about our progress against the long-term five and 10-year goals that we've laid out to you. There's never that kind of, of, of work. So that 
if that kind of commitment needs to be driven by the board because that's where the so continuity is going to be. You got a lot of people in this room who have the ability to change that. A lot of I, a lot of board members in this room. What's your advice to them on 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 how you change that dynamic? I, I, well, my one bit of advice would be that the board needs to set the dialogue, not management. And you know, too often boards, again, because of the burdens that are on them. And I sit on a board that I think is very high performing. But when you see the size of the agenda and the thousand pages that come out before the quarter, it's just very, it, it's very hard to actually get a focus on long term in addition to everything else that we need to do. Lydia, you were part of a study group that recommended providing in, uh, increased voting rights for long term shareholders. Well, uh, is I, that a good idea? I think that it's something worth considering. I think it would be a, um, um, a very interesting change in the dynamic if we had tenure weighted voting. So people that held stock a longer period of time would have a, um, a, have a more heavily weighted vote. It is a different way to go. I mean, one of the things that has happened in, in recent years is the increase in dual class of stock. And so you see now, I mean, if you go back 10 years, you probably didn't see anybody going public with two classes of stock. Now I think you're up to like 15% of the IPOs have dual class stock. And that's a way to have the founders or the, the current people in charge um, have control of the company for a longer period of time. And I think there's a lot of negatives about dual class stock, but one of the things it does do is preserve the vision of the founders and the starting, um, you know, the, the people who started the company. And it allows them to progress in their, toward their long-term vision. I think tenure weighted voting is another one of those things that could help in that regard because it would um, give more weight to people that held their stock longer. I mean, I think it's interesting. There's another study that just came out from um, uh, a guy named Rob Danes at Stanford that suggests that um, staggered boards actually contribute to long-term um, uh, better, better results, particularly in young companies or companies that are heavily uh, reliant on R&D and uh, innovation. And I think that's worth considering because a lot of the things that have happened in corporate governance that were the trends for the last 20 years have been to take away uh, the, the whole management entrenchment, but take away the defenses for the current um, management and board. And in some ways that contributes to the, the short term nature because you don't have any um, a confidence that you're going to be able to see it, see through to the long-term vision. So I think there's a lot of things, including tenure, uh, tenure way voting, that are worth considering. Andy, what what can investors like you uh, do to? So I think I think well, some of the things that we do as a as an organization. So we do have it's 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 hard for us to be um, going company by company and saying we need to um, offer a proxy. Uh, issue on this topic because we think this board is not uh, operating improperly. We just have too many of them. So what we have is, have is rules. But we do engage in um, industry organizations that are, uh, you know, thinking about things like, uh, you know, time-weighted, uh, uh, time ownership-weighted uh, voting, those types of things, um, and issues that you know, we can incorporate into our rules. So we do engage in those types of things that are more top you know, thinking about the bigger pictures and as opposed to the individual companies and trying to think about, you know, what is best practices for corporations and, and boards. So we're doing those types of things. Um, and then in our investment, we're trying, maybe this is not, not answering your question directly, but we, we try actively to uh, move away from um, short-termism. Uh, and we, you know, it's not, we don't look at our managers and say, okay, you underperformed this quarter, you're out. We kind of th think longer term, we think about their strategy and those types of things even in places where we have hedge funds uh, that might engage in more short-term trying to, you know, short-term investing is not a bad thing because there are, uh, there are, the, the price is supposed to be, uh, uh, provide information and if the price is not uh, reflecting um, yeah, the, the correct information, people who arbitrage those small uh, differences are, are providing yeah. a service. So there's not a bad thing. But, you know, even in those hedge fund worlds, we try to uh, move to what we call a we call a longer term crystallization. So instead of paying a, a hedge fund manager uh, an incentive fee every year, we say, okay, we're going to look over a longer period of time for you before you get paid. So uh, they, they have longer term uh, viewpoints. Yeah, Neri, how about executive compensation? How would, what, what do you recommend to make it 
work for the long term? Uh, again, I'll probably reiterate some of the things I said earlier, but uh, it must be tied to the drivers. Uh, it must be tied to the long term. Uh, it must be tied to the seats that I'm playing today, not the tenure that I'm with the organization. So I, I know it's difficult to do, I know it's difficult to measure, but given the CEO tenure, there's some challenge in the measures because almost by definition, your compensation will be tied to a very, very short tenure, including your exit plans and other things. So, and, and the other challenging thing is that you always attribute the, all the bad stuff to your predecessor, all the success to, your, uh, to yourself, <laughs> and then when you depart, your successor is going to do the same. So uh, the sum of the parts doesn't add up. Right at the end of the day, yeah. because you end up you, you end up overcompensating if you're a shareholder. It's quite simple. Now yeah. the question is how you go back and right size it. There could be some element, and I'm 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 interested in other panelists' view, but this is only my my thinking about whether uh, tying some compensation to long-term objectives, whether or not I'm on the payroll at that time, and at that point it could could be aligned with the horizon, with the uh, with, with the strategies that I've been asked to. Uh, execute upon, even it survive my tenure, my retirement, my uh, with the organization, and put it on much more, much longer horizon. Should th this be the horizon to be uh, promoted by the board and the investor at that time? Uh, if we do that, and you change the weighing, uh, it may promote uh, stewardship, uh, less focus on your individual results, and, and much greater accountability to your stakeholders. Let's uh, open it up for questions, and I, I, I'd love to hear from one of the people back there who think that this is a conversation in search of a problem, that we don't really have one, uh, if one of you is, uh, are willing to stand up and say why. Come on, be bold. Other questions? Right here. Uh, John Spector from the conference board. I'm glad to hear that the discussion briefly veered into the agency problem and the, and the role of individuals who are ultimately the beneficiaries of all the capital. Um, uh, I realize that that's not how we think about it or talk about it. Um, and I'm glad, Andy, that you brought up the dessert analogy because I think it provides a real contrast. There's been so much consumer education about the harmful behavior, um, working with individuals, working with the agents, in that case, you know, the beverage companies and the food companies and so forth, and the world hasn't changed overnight, but there have been very material changes in individual behavior as a result of that education and, and, indus and the agents who provide the products and services. That focus on the consumer, the ultimate beneficiary, is almost completely lacking in, in the financial services world. There's a lot of discussion about these issues, but they're, if I can call it sort of B2B discussions like we're having in this room, we're not, there aren't mass education initiatives out there to explain to my mother, who's a retired school teacher and lives entirely off of her investment income, why, why she has, why she's the ultimate solution to this problem and why it's bad for her to not know whether, whether where she places her money follows the principles that Ron has laid out in this letter, which are fantastic, or some other set of principles. Is, is this too complicated? Is this an opportunity in the future? Is it kind of a something similar to what we've done with food and overweightness, uh, a solution, or is it just, and wh why haven't we gotten to that, or is it because it's not gonna work, it's too complicated, whatever, I mean, medicine is pretty complicated, if you look at, so, so I'm just wondering what, what is the role of education and so forth, and I'm asking this at, at the CED meeting, because I think CED can actually play a role if we believe that consumer education is a potential long-term solution. Anyone? I'll take that. Um, I think the, the, there's an incredible dearth of financial education uh, to consumers, and the problem's gotten even worse. Because if you think about retirement plans, which is the, you know, in, for an individual, that's the ultimate long term. You know, I'm saving and accumulating capital for some distant decade in the future. Um, you know, in the good old days, uh, our parents were mostly covered by defined benefit plans. You know, which were managed by professionals, uh, you know, had lots of opportunity to invest in all sorts of different things, recognize that this was long-term, could take advantage of illiquidity premiums. I mean, that's all pretty complicated stuff to then say to the individual who's now responsible for it himself, half of them have some workplace plan, the other half have nothing, so they're truly on their own. 
and there's no really good way to deliver that education. And um, the, the problem is what they do hear about, driven by the media and driven by you know what's available out there on the business, uh, in, in the you know the TV investment press and all sorts of things like that. It's you know what stock to buy now, which is actually the least important thing out there. But these are pretty hard concepts and. Um, the way I believe to get at this is recognizing that, you know, I've, I've said this in other forums, right? We teach kids about sex, we teach them about drugs, but we don't teach them how to invest, right? And uh, it's gotta be incorporated into the, into the elementary and high school curriculums. The policy uh, approach here, and this is where policy actually has worked, was in the Pension Protection Act of 2006, right? Where it said there are these safe harbors for these kinds of investments that are long-term, and that, by the way, they really rely on the likelihood that the investor is just gonna let inertia take over. So if you think about your average target date fund, that's all that that is, right? It recognizes that, you know, you, John Spector, are 29 years old, you've got a long ways to go, this is the right fund for you, and it's, it's good enough because it takes into account all those other things. So there are some policy pieces here, but the educational piece requires a ton of work in some ways, the fiduciary rule that's come out, which had very, very good, uh, it, it, it's got a good purpose and we shouldn't lose that purpose, but that is also going to endanger some of the education that's available. Uh, a question here, then a question back there, and then a question right over here. So I, I'm uh, Tom Ackerman, I'm, I'm CEO of a Fortune 500 insurance company. And, and I just a couple comments. One is, uh, I've been in the in insurance industry for 38 years. When I started, if you came up with a new product that was more competitive than was in the marketplace, you could probably have a good run with that product for about three years or so, maybe five. Today, it's about one day, because any product you come up with is matched by, com just because of the ability to re-engineer products. So I, I do think, no matter what is going on with shareholders, I think the, you know, we used to do five-year plans. We now do three-year plans, and many of our board members question, should we do a six quarter rolling plan because in f one thing you know is in five years the world's gonna be totally different in technology nokia is i think the best example with one point not too long ago they're a leading manufacturer of uh mobile phones now they're sort of out of business uh just because they were taken over so the the depending on what industry and the pace of global competition and the uh advantage that a company can have can change overnight because of technology. You know, for Chevron, it's you know, fracking probably you know has a has had a big impact. But so that's one issue. Is I just think the horizons in general are shorter because the global economy is moving so much faster. I do think there's enormous pressure on share buybacks. You know, I think in the corporate theory. You know, when I was in business school, is cor is share buybacks don't add anything to long-term value. You're just you, you, you do raise the stock price in the short run because you same earnings divided by a fewer number of shares. But there is enormous pressure on CEOs to buy. Even, and I would say in our industry, uh, there, there are probably 10 sell-side analysts who are the most followed. And, every, and many of those analysts rate companies not by necessarily their long-term strategy, but what's their capital, you know, capital management plan, how many shares are going to buy back. So there's a lot of pressure uh, on that, and I do think to the points that have, that have been made, uh, the horizon of investors is a lot shorter. So, I don't know that it's good or bad. I think it's going to it's going to be shorter than longer because of just the global economy has changed dramatically. Uh, but I do think uh, we ought to, in CED and others, ought to be pushing boards uh, because I think it's only it's the board pushing boards pushing to boards do boards to as much as they can. Uh, push management to, to take as long a term horizon as is appropriate for that company or industry. That they're in. e even though, as you just said, you can't, you really don't know what the world is going to look like in three years. That's right. And the I, uncertainty is greater of, of that longer horizon is greater than ever before. That's right. Uh, question right back there behind the pole. Thank you, Andy Green from the Center for American Progress. Curious if you could comment on how changes in um, uh, active versus passive and the rise of passive investment strategies, whether it's in 
you know, general S&P 500 funds or ETFs, et cetera, um, affects this? Does this enable, uh, does this uh, enable greater uh, long-termism by having investors long-term focused in funds, or does it uh, dampen some of the accountability by having um, you know, less of a feedback between shareholders and, their invest and, the, and the boards and companies? It's a great question. Yeah, go ahead, Ron. Well, we're one of the large passive investors, so why don't I start? Andy, you probably have a perspective on this, too. Um, you know, for us, we view ourselves as probably the longest uh, term capital, right? We are the closest thing to permanent capital. You, know, you made the reference to our investment in you. Part of it is because you're in the index. As long as you're in the whatever the index is, the, the Dow, the S&P 500, we're going to be invested in you. So for us, that puts, we don't have the option to say we're sick of management, we're going to vote. We can't turn the S&P 500 into the S&P 499. So for us, it puts a lot of attention on stewardship. It puts a lot of attention on what exactly is management doing over the long term. We're very, uh, we, uh, we're not unwelcoming of activists, but we're very careful about the activist agenda because what we don't want to be is somebody coming in, uh, doing something in the short term that's going to create some kind of a pop over you know, one, two, three years, and then leave the long-term shareholders, which is who we represent, you know, holding the bag. So I would say that the rise of passive, and you know, we can debate on whether it's good or not, but has created a set of shareholders here that are very focused on this issue. But, but so let me ask you then, how do you look at uh, activists? Because there must be cases where you look at an activist and say, they're pushing this company in a good direction and other cases where you look at an activist and say they're just trying to get the cash out and move on. I mean, you've answered the question, it's case by case. We yeah. probably get, uh, we probably have three activists a day contacting us on some uh, different idea they have. And what do you, how do you find the balance? Uh, more good, more bad, uh, equal amounts of both? It's probably equal amounts yeah, of both. That's a... Andy, do you want it? Um, so we don't engage with uh, activist shareholders you know, uh, directly. We don't have any money invested in any of the, uh, you know, uh, activist funds. Um, uh, and I'm not, part of it's we're not sure, you know, how it if it works for us politically. So um, if one of our in-state companies happens to be a target, I don't know what you know. We'll, we'll have lots of pressure. So we'll, uh, we we try not to uh, uh, draw attention to ourselves too much. Um, but but also it's it's. Um, it's, it's very volatile, and you can have, uh, um, you know, uh, big swings. We've seen big swings in some of these activist investors uh, that is not predictable. So uh, we, we tend not to do have... You, do, you, do you have a sense, more good, more bad, yeah, equal I mean, amounts of both? I've read some studies that say, you know, the activist shareholders, um, I think early, they were, you know, there were a lot of green mail type. That's why we have all the proxy, you know, uh, uh, rules about paying green mail and that kind of stuff. I think that's gone away. Uh, you know, these guys are spending a lot of money to uh, get invested and, and, and start a proxy fight. So um, th they have to have pretty good conviction about what they're doing. Some of yep. them are short term, but I think most of them now are think they think there's something going on in the company that is being mismanaged and it can be f fixed. Yep. Uh, whether it's a, whether it's a short term fix or a long term fix, they think it, it makes it better. And if you look at the data on stock price performance, it doesn't really show that there's any you know near term pop and then the stock goes back down, um, it, it, it seems like the, the stock is uh, permanently improved through the act, uh, activist uh, uh, activities. Lydia, you wanted to say oh, something? I just else? wanted to make two quick points. I think in some ways because of the large number of passive investors, it gives the, the activist investors and those who want to have a voice a, a bigger um, platform to speak on because they're the ones that are really speaking up on, on strategy. But I think the whole thing of activist investors and, and how they do go and recruit support from the, the, the non-activist investors really goes back to the importance of Ron's earlier point of the importance of having that long-term communication with your large stockholders and trying to make sure your large stockholders, the large holdings and particularly the passive investors like that, understand your strategy and understand where you're trying to get and hopefully support it so that they won't be swayed uh, in a different direction if you have a good strategy. There was a question uh, right here, yes. Uh, Carolyn what? Chen, millennials. Many compensation programs are based on the boomers. I'm on a board of an engineering company 
And these millennials expect to have 20 jobs, not necessarily with that company. And it's hard to have programs that really kick in based on ten, a certain amount of tenure. Could you talk about the impact of millennials on short-termism and any suggestions? just have them living in my house. Um. <laughs> I think those are real challenges for boards because the millennials that I know aren't very uh, patient and, and they want everything now. And the whole notion that, that um, uh, Nuri suggested about having compensation that pays out in 10 years, even if you've moved on to you know, three other jobs, is not going to be very appealing to them. But that might be in the best interest of the stockholders. So I think it's a real challenge. I, I just want to make another point that uh, I think is important in the context of millennials and the things that are important to them, including you know social impacts, environmental impact, and what they attach to first to create their loyalty to the company, and them being the investors of the future is an important one, and actually should fit into some communication that the company should have, and as we we starting to see it evolving, uh, and, and secondly, it puts another dimension of you know culture, uh, and not necessarily tenure, but to me, it's also similar to the CEO and the role of the board. Uh, should company strategy, should company profile, should company DNA survive the, the CEO? Or when you replace the CEO, you're replacing the DNA. And if you subscribe to the former, right, you should be thinking about it in the same context about your employees and how notwithstanding the fact that you do a little bit of turnover and some things, the company survived the churn, actually, which may not be a bad thing, right? But if it's the opposite and you're zigzagging, then you have a challenge. Question right here. All right. Sean Egan, Egan Jones Ratings Company and Egan Jones Proxy Services. Warren Buffett has created terrific long-term value by, uh, long, terrific value by focusing on the long term. Is it because he is a great selector of companies or has he created the proper environment for those companies to thrive? In other words, has he has solved the short-term problem we're all talking about today? It's a question for the panel. Anybody want to take that on? I'll, I'll, I'll take a cut at it. I mean, I, I think it's a combination of both. I mean, part of it is, remember, it's owned in an insurance company with long-term liabilities. So he's buying assets, you know, very specifically to meet very long-term liabilities. So there's no internal pressure to actually turn something over in the short term. If there's any pressure, it's I need to buy something now that's going to be in place and generating the kind of returns I need for those long-term liabilities. So that coupled with some, you know, it, it's, it's got a terrific management team in each of those companies. He's got a whole s way of, if you've ever been out to the annual meeting, a whole way of running each of those businesses. So, but I, I wouldn't underestimate the ownership structure there. So uh, we are, uh, we're unfortunately out of time, but can we just, can you, Neri, could you very quickly, I know you're working on the CED committee that is working on these issues. Can you very quickly tell us what CED is planning to do in this area? So CED, in conjunction with its 70 year, 70th year anniversary, will publish a compendium on a variety of topics. Uh, and I think the topic we discuss here today will cut across many topics that we've discussed. I'll, I'll encourage the folks in the room to look at the paper the uh, CED had issued uh, post-financial crisis that spoke about uh, rebuilding corporate leadership. And it emphasized the uh, corporate board accountability. Uh, and and I, I'll, I'm just going to read it to make sure that I'm doing justice to the CED's work. Uh, CED had advocated that corporate boards and the leaders incorporate the relevant uh, societal concerns such as environmental and human rights consideration into corporate strategy to strengthen long-term competitiveness and sustainability. Uh, the second point of emphasis is that uh, societal and business leaders must learn to treat each other as partners, not, not as adversaries. Uh, directors should act as stewards of long-term interests and therefore should weigh societal issues that impact the firm long-term performance. Uh, last but not least, the board should consider try, uh, tying a portion of a CEO and senior management performance compensation to metrics based on the compensation, uh, on the corporation's uh, performance on ethics, honest reporting, and engagement with shareholders and other interested parties. The other point that we made uh, uh, yesterday is what should leaders do uh, if they're going out of this session tomorrow and think about what the 
um, what their next step should be. And I think the CED made, uh, made, made a point on that topic as well in, in summarizing the topic. And let me just read it to you as well, just to make sure that I'm not shortchanging the CED's work here. Uh, and the conclusion was that you as business leader, uh, which many of you are here in the room, uh, today should consider both how their business strategies interact with social societal issues and how they personally, and the focus is on personally, can make a difference uh, by supporting sound public policies that address the society key concerns, many of which were discussed throughout this conference. Okay, good. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you uh, to the panel. It's a, a very interesting and difficult issue.